I would like to direct your attention to two portions of scripture. The first verse that I want to read is found in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. The second verse is found in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. Let's read verse from the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Then Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8 reads, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now I want to speak to you on the subject, how to train the human spirit. You know your spirit can be educated just as the mind can be. And your spirit can be built up in strength as the body can be built up. I have four rules by which it can be accomplished. So we need to realize that our spirits uh, can, as we said, be educated, trained, developed, just as our mind can. Or our spirits can be trained and developed and built up in strength, just as our body can be. Too many times we've taken time to educate the mind. We've taken time even to build up the body and have neglected the human spirit. I remember a number of years ago, I was holding a meeting in a certain place, and a young man said to me, a boy about 16 years old, and he was a very short boy and underdeveloped. He had a sunken chest. And so he said to me, you think it'd be all right to take a, a little physical education or a physical development culture? And I said, well, sure. And so I remember I went back, oh, about a year later, I think really about 15 months later, uh, holding a meeting in his daddy's church, for he was the son of a minister. And this young man said to me, well, of course, the moment I could see him, I could see a difference in him. He's no longer sunken chested. And he called me aside and pulled his shirt off and showed me how he had developed, I believe he said, a seven-inch chest expansion. And then his arm, I believe the bicep, I think you call it. Anyway, the muscle in his arm, how it had been built up. And so he had built himself up in this 15-month period until he just simply didn't even look like the same individual. Well, you know, friends, you can build yourself up spiritually. Now, you will not be able to build yourself up spiritually or educate or train your spirit just overnight any more than you're able to educate and train your mind overnight. Or this young man was able to build up his body overnight. But in the process of time, as he put certain exercises and went into operation and went by certain rules, he event eventually accomplished the job that he set out to do, which was to develop his body. That just because you may practice these rules, these four rules that I'm about to give you, just because you practice them one day, one week, one month, or even one year, is no sign that you're just simply going to arrive by then. But I'll tell you this, as you are continue to practice these rules, you'll find that you will develop spiritually and be built up spiritually and that your spirit will be educated and trained. Now then notice these, these rules. Number one, uh, the developing or the training of the human spirit comes by meditation in the Word. Number two, it comes by practicing the Word. Number three, it comes by giving the Word first place. Number four, it comes by instantly obeying the voice of our spirit, or I should say the voice of your spirit. Now, after a while, you can know the will of God the Father in all the minor details of life. Because, you see, he communicates with your spirit and not with your mind or the reasoning faculties. As you instantly obey uh, your spirit, you will find that you are obeying the Holy Spirit. Because you remember that God said in his word, Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now this means that God is going to use your own spirit to enlighten you. Notice the expression, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. He'll use your own spirit to enlighten you, to guide you. Now, the, let's look at these four rules that I gave you. Number one is that the, the training, the educating, the development of your spirit comes by meditation in the Word. You'll notice that of these uh, four points, three of them have to do with the Word of God. 
we must realize the value of God's Word. And we must realize the value of quiet meditation in the Word of God. The most deeply spiritual men and women I know are people who give time to meditation in the Word of God. You cannot develop spiritual wisdom without meditation. God told Joshua that fact, you remember, in the very beginning of his ministry. After the death of Moses, here in Joshua 1.8, God said to Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Another translation reads, instead of saying thou shalt have good success, said, you will be able to deal wisely in the affairs of life, or the things of life. Now you certainly wouldn't have good success if you couldn't deal wisely in the affairs of life or in the things of life. And so God told Joshua to meditate in the word. He told him that if he would do it, then he would make his way prosperous and he would have good success. I remember a good many years ago, I was teaching at a ministerial conference or convention. And so I taught a lesson uh, along this line, not just the same lesson, but along this line particularly this part about meditation. And I remember that one minister during this convention asked me to come to his church and hold a meeting, and I did. And when I went to his church for the meeting, he told me that he had been trying to make a success of his church. And if he heard of a pastor anywhere in the United States or Canada who was doing real well, that he'd go and visit with him and watch what he did. He would see what kind of program he might have. He said that he would try to put another man's program into action in his church, but it never seemed to work. He would fly all around the country doing this. Now, I think that many of us are like this, too. We, we, we want to copy somebody else and find something that, uh, that'll work from the natural standpoint. But this minister told me that he decided he would just simply... Uh, do what I'd suggested in this Bible lesson, for I'd given this text about meditation. And that, after all, he said, well, if I'm going to have good success and pastor in my church, I'll follow what the rule that God gave to Joshua, and I'll, I'll begin meditation in the Word. So, he said, he began to take time out each morning to wait upon God and to meditate upon the Word. He said, after 30 days of praying and meditating, not asking God to do something so much as just waiting on him, meditating on the word, that one Sunday they just had a landslide. They had more people saved in this one Sunday than they had the whole two or three years before that. Well, his people got revived. He began to have good success in all the church work. And, uh, you know, that's... Uh, pastor in the church was his life's work. That's where he needed to have good success. But your life calling may be something else. But it's certainly true that your way can be prosperous also, and you can have good success, or you can know how to deal wisely in the affairs of life. Take time to meditate in the Word of God. Shut yourself in alone with your own spirit where the world is shut out. If you're going or if you're ambitious to do something worthwhile, I would suggest that you begin by taking 10 or 15 minutes daily by med for meditation. Now that isn't much. But begin by taking 10 or 15 minutes and then uh, it'll grow. Begin the development of your own spirit. And here is where the development of your own spirit begins is by taking time to meditate in the Word. So I said then that number one, the training, the educating, the development, developing of the human spirit comes by meditation in the Word. Now number two is that it comes by practicing the Word. Now practicing the Word 
means being a doer of the word. You remember James says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. We've got talkers about the word, and we've got people who rejoice about the word, but we don't have many doers of the word. You can't be a doer of the word and continue to talk unbelief. That's the reason I know so many people are not doing the word. Because if they were practicing the word of God, they would not be talking doubt and discouragement and fear and failure and defeat. You know, that's so important. I want to say it again. I said, we've got a lot of people who are talkers about the word. And Pentecostal people, full gospel people, rejoice. They'll praise God and shout about it. But we do not have many doers of the word. You can't be a doer of the word and continue to talk unbelief. Now that's the reason that I know that so many people are not doers of the word. Because I hear them constantly talking unbelief, talking doubt, talking fear, talking failure, talking discouragement. Well, if they were a doer of the word, they would be doing that. Because the word of God will not teach them to do that. The word of God teaches them to walk by faith and to talk by faith because our talk is a part of our walk. And so if we're walking by faith, well then of course we're talking faith. And if we're talking faith, we're walking by faith. And you know the Bible said we walk by faith and not by sight. Now here in James, the first chapter, the 22nd verse, it says, But be ye doers of the word. James 1.22 but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now the margin reads, deluding your own self. We have many self-deluded people. They have deluded themselves. Oh, I know, they lay it on to somebody else, and some of them even lay it on to the devil. But really, as the scripture said here, deceiving or deluding yourselves. They have deluded themselves. Now, friends, stop deluding yourself. Begin to practice being a doer of the word. And under all circumstances, do what the word tells you to do. Now, some people think that being a doer of the word is to keep the Ten Commandments. No, that's not what he's talking about here. After all, we under the new covenant have but one commandment. That is the commandment of love. You know, Jesus said, uh, I give you a new commandment. And this new commandment was that you love one another. Now, you know, if, if you love someone, you won't steal from them. You won't lie about him. And so, you know, Paul said love is the fulfilling of, of the law. If you walk in love, you won't break any law that was given to curb sin. So it means to walk in love, all right. That's what it means to be a doer of the word. But it also means to do primarily what is written in the epistles. You know, these are the letters that are written to the church. And so we need, need to be a doer of the new covenant. Not a doer of the old covenant, but a doer of the new covenant. The epistles belong to us. Philippians 4, chapter 6, verse is written to the church. These letters, the epistles, are written to the church. They belong to us. It's the word that's given to us. Let's be a doer of it. Let's, let's look here at Philippians 4, 6. It says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your request be made known unto God. So, do that. Uh, another translation reads, instead of saying, be careful for nothing, I think that's a little blind to us, but the Amplified Translation reads, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving. Now, we practice part of that. We don't mind practicing the part that says to pray, but if you just practice that part and not the other part, you're not practicing the word or you're not being a doer of the word. You're not a doer of the word. First, he said, not to fret. Now, if you're going to fret and have anxieties, then it isn't going to do any good to make requests. 
We teach prayer. But why don't we just go ahead and teach the whole story on it? Why teach just part of it? That kind of praying doesn't work. That kind of over-anxious prayer, full of fretfulness, doesn't work. I remember a little saying that I read years ago in the newspaper. This, this little old saying was, a scared prayer ain't no account. Well, this little, little excerpt was the saying of a man who wrote in the paper. The man who wrote it said that down in the state of Georgia years ago, there was a man and his wife and his son out in the field chopping cotton. Now this, this son was a full-grown fellow, nearly 30 years of, old, of age, but he never married. He still lived at home. He wasn't just really all there mentally. Well, there came up a cloud. It began to thunder and to lighten. The lightning began to flash. It looked like it was just going to rain in a moment, but the old man wanted to hoe out to the end of the row. The lady and the boy wanted to go to the house, but he said they should all finish their rows that they were on before... And so before they could finish, the lightning became very bad, and the thunder rolled, it began to rain, so they just threw down their hose and began to run towards the house. When, it's, when, it, when they saw that it just looked like they weren't going to make it, the storm in full fury was just breaking upon them, the old man and lady got out on their hands and knees and began to pray. Then the boy, or the, the young man, who hadn't gotten down on his knees to pray, but continued to run, turned around and and yelled to them, Come on, Ma and Pa, a scared prayer ain't no account. Well, you know, friends, there's much truth to this. That's what the Spirit of God is saying through Paul. Paul is telling the people that when he said, Be careful for nothing. Or, as we read here, the Amplified Translation, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And so let's not only be a doer of the latter part of the script of this verse, Philippians 4, 6, but let's be a doer of the whole verse. Now I'm only using this verse as an illustration. We need to take the whole New Testament, all these letters that are written to the epistles, our epistles that are written to the churches, and be a doer of them. I remember in connection with this verse of scripture here in Philippians that a number of years ago a minister came to me. Well, I felt so sorry for him. But sometimes, you know, just feeling sorry for a person, a minister, whoever they are, doesn't help him. It doesn't give him an answer just to sympathize with him. Something I know had come up in this man's life. The storms and the tests were on. He couldn't sleep. His stomach, according to his testimony to me, was upset. He wasn't able to keep anything down that he ate. His nerves were just shot because of this particular incident. He came to me to see if I could help him. And thank God I could. At first, he sort of rebelled against the help. Though really, it was God's help. I began to tell him what the Word said and how to pray about it. I had him take this scripture and, and, and read it. This very scripture that I've given you, Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And I had him to read it from the, trans, uh, the Amplified Translation. Do not fret to have any anxiety about anything. But uh, he would say then to me, Oh, yes, but everybody doesn't have the faith that you have. I told him that they didn't, but they did have the same Bible I have. I told him that it wasn't a matter of having a lot of faith. He told me it seemed that I didn't have a care in the world. I told him this was because I was practicing the word. I kept telling him that even though people didn't have as strong a faith as, they did, as I did, they did have the same Bible. And if they'd practice it, they could build up their faith and become strong in faith. I told him that it's a matter of endeavoring to practice the word. I told him that as long as he was going to worry and fret, he wasn't going to sleep or eat. I told him that when I get alone and read this verse out loud, I tell the Lord that his word is true and I believe it. I told this minister that he would be tempted to say he couldn't help worrying and fretting. But I told him, that God hadn't asked us to do something that we can't do. Now, when God said not to fret, this, this means then that we can keep from it. God is a just God. 
And he won't ask us to do something that we can't do. I believe that I could make my request known unto God, but it was hard to believe that I couldn't fret. But God said that we don't have to fret. I would say then that I refuse to fret or have any anxiety about anything. Now, I told all this to this minister I was telling you about. I would tell the Lord, I said then, that I bring my request unto him. And then I would thank him for the answer. This quiets my spirit and pacifies the troubled spirit that the devil tries to make me have. I get up and go, and before I know it, the devil is trying to get me again. I just simply go right back and read this verse again and keep claiming it. Now, see, I'm telling this minister and you two how, how I practice the word. After I told this minister all this, he told me later that when he started doing this, the problem worked out and did not get as big as he was expecting. He was going to be sued over a certain condition, but it didn't amount to anything. God helped him out of it. Now, you know, friends, you can become so fretful over something that you don't eat or sleep. Your stomach feels as though it has butterflies in it. All you have to do is to practice the word and you'll get results. Now, we read Philippians 4, 6. Uh, let's read the 7th and 8th verses of this 4th chapter of the book of Philippians also and see what he said will happen as a result of practicing the 6th verse. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then he went on the 8th verse and said, Finally, the brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, many people want what the seventh verse talks about, but they don't want to do what the sixth verse says to do to get it. You see, the seventh verse says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But it only happens as you practice verse 6. See, they don't want to practice what the sixth verse says, whether we, uh, which we read earlier. But in order to get what the seventh verse says, you have to practice the sixth verse. God's peace, one translation says, will garrison and mount guard over your heart. In other words, it will keep guard over your heart and your spirit. Friends, the education of our spirits, the training of our human spirit, the development of our human spirit comes by practicing, number two, by practicing the word. Can you reap the results and have peace and not be a doer of the word? No, you really can't. Some people who worry and fret continually think on the wrong side of life. They continually talk unbelief. The more you talk about something, the bigger they get. If something isn't true, honest, just, pure, and lovely, then don't think about it. You see, this eighth verse says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think all these things. Now, remember I said practice the word, be a doer of the word? All right, do verse 8. Do verse 8. Practice this verse. Now, you see, uh, uh, so many times, as I said, so many times people are thinking about the wrong thing. Now, you know what they're thinking about because what they talk. Out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible said, the mouth speaketh. They, they continually worry and fret and think on the wrong side of life. They continually talk unbelief. And as I said, the more you talk about some things, the bigger they get. If something isn't true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and so on, meets all these qualifications, then don't think about it. It may be true, but it not be, might not be lovely. So don't think about it and don't talk about it. The Amplified Translation, a version reads, The love of God in us is ever ready to believe the best of every person. I found out through the years that most of the stories that I've heard about people aren't true anyway. So don't, don't talk about these stories you hear. Don't even think about it. You can hear everything in the world. 
Some things you hear might be true, but they not, might not be pure and lovely. And notice it says, and of good report. So then you should not think about them. We give place to the devil by thinking about these things. The devil's greatest weapon is the power of suggestion. The devil is ever seeking and endeavoring to enter into your thought life. That's why Paul is saying this here in Philippians 4, 8, think on these things. So then meditate and feed on the letters that were written to the church. These are letters then that are written to you as a believer. Here is God the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. And so meditate upon these letters and upon what he has to say. And then be a doer of the word. Now, if you'll do that, you will grow spiritually. I remember on one occasion, uh, Smith Wigglesworth in England was visiting in the home of a friend. Now, this friend was a very wealthy man. At this time, Wigglesworth had great financial pressure upon him. Debts that needed to be paid. Money that he did not have. But he was a doer of the word, not just a hero. He had acted upon these scriptures that I'm speaking of here in Philippians 4, 6, 7, and 8. And he re did not have any anxiety or fret about anything. But uh, he had brought it to the Lord and believed God to meet his needs. And the peace of God that passed all understanding, you see, was, was guarding his heart. And so he was full of joy, even though naturally speaking, the needs were pressing upon him. Yet he was full of joy and full of praise. And as they walked through the beautiful garden in this rich man's garden or home, uh, this man said to him, I'd give anything in the world. In fact, he said, I'd just, I'd just give all I own, every penny I've got, my home, all my riches, I'd give it if I had the joy you have, the peace that you have. Wigglesworth said it won't cost you a penny. Won't cost you a penny. All you got to do it just practice the word. All you got to do is just to be a doer of the word. Now, he didn't talk about this need that was pressing upon him. He didn't press him, talk about the great financial pressures and the debts that were owed and the him being unable to pay him. If he had just even suggested to this man, he is a man of wealth, he'd, he would have helped him and would have paid it all for him. But he was walking by faith. He was being a doer of the word. The word says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so he is walking by faith, counting it done. So therefore, he's not talking about it or even asking the man for money. And he didn't ask him. The man didn't help him. But because he did believe God, every need was met. But you know, he was just as happy about it and praising God for the answer before it happened as he was after it happened. You see, he was a doer of the word. Now, as I said to you, I want to reiterate this, that I've merely used Philippians 4, 6, 7, and 8 verses as an illustration of what I mean, be a doer of the word. I don't only mean we do for this, but as I said, that means that we take the New Testament and we meditate upon it, primarily now the letters that were written to the church. We feed on these letters and uh, we become a doer of what is written there. And if you do that, you'll be able to begin to train your spirit and you will grow spiritually. Now then, that will bring me to the third point, or this third rule that I'm giving you on uh, how to train the human spirit. Now number three is that the training, the developing, the educating of our spirits comes by giving, number three, giving the Word of God first place in our lives. This means to give the word, the word, first place in our lives. You know, Proverbs chapter 4 is a very wonderful portion of scripture. If you haven't noticed it before, I wish you'd get your Bibles and turn to it. Open your scriptures, your Bibles there. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 22. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, 21, and 22. Now it says, my son attend to my words incline thine ears unto my sayings 
keep them in the midst of thine heart. Let them not depart from before thine eyes. And then it says, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they, my words, are life unto those that find them. Now notice something else. And health to all their flesh. Or the margin reads, medicine to all their flesh. There is healing in the word. Health, my words, he said, are health to all their flesh, are medicine to all their flesh. Always put the word of God first. Now, it's a strange thing to me that some people just won't do this. You know, I passed in another 12 years. I've had members who would get sick, go to the hospital, and afterwards ask for prayer. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to have a doctor. Certainly not. I believe in doctors. And, uh, in fact, we have uh, one doctor on our board of uh, directors of our evangelistic association. But why not just put God's word first? As a last resort, sometimes, Christian people will turn to the word. But you see, instead of uh, just making it a last resort, let's put God's word first. Notice that the text said here, Proverbs 4, 20, My son, attend to my words. Not just what does that mean anyway. Attend to my words. Well, that means put my word first. Now, for instance, we'll just say a good friend of yours, uh, uh, you met him on the street today or tomorrow or yesterday. And so you saw him walking just a few little ways away. So you rushed to catch up with him, tapped him on the shoulder, shook hands with him, and wanted to visit with him a little while. And this friend said to you, well, I wish I had time to visit, but as he looked at his watch, he said, I'm, I'm 10 minutes late. I was, I was supposed to be at the bank here 10 minutes ago. I'm running a little late. I have some business that I must attend to. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he'd like to talk to you, all right. He wouldn't want to insult you. But he had to put this business first. That's what he meant. When he said, I have some business that I must attend to, he just simply saying, I must put this business first. Now, when God in his word in Proverbs 4.20 said, my son, attend to my words. What do you mean? He meant the same thing. He meant put my word first. Put my word first. I notice that it pays rich dividends to put God's word first. I know there's some more things involved here. Like, uh, uh, the, uh, he not only said to tend to my words, but incline thine ear to my sayings. Listen to what I've got to say. Let your eyes not depart from before the word of God. That is, keep looking at what I've got to say. Keep them in your heart. But uh, there, there's rich dividends for doing this. My son, attend to my word. Put my word first. For he says, why? Why does he want to put your word first? Or his word first? Why does he want us to, to, to listen to what he's got to say and, and keep what he said before our eyes? For he said, they, my words, are life. They're life. Unto those that find them. My words, he said, are health. And as I said, the margin, the King James translation read, said, my words are medicine to all their flesh. I want to reemphasize it. By putting God's word first, it not only does something for your spirit, but it'll do something for your body. There is healing, physical healing, because health to all their flesh. Healing in the word. So let me reiterate it. Always put the word of God first. Now, as I said, it's a strange thing to me that some folks just won't do this. I said to you, I passed it nearly 12 years. I've had members who would get sick, go to the hospital, and afterwards ask for prayer. Now, as we said to you, it's certainly not wrong to have a doctor. We believe in doctors and hospitals and thank God for good doctors, the Christian doctors. and Many, many Christian doctors are close friends of mine and thank God for them. But uh, let's, let's, let's put God's word first. Why not just put God's word first as a last resort sort of, you know. Sometimes Christian people will turn to the word. I remember a number of years ago I was staying in the home of a full gospel deacon. We were holding revival in this church. And this man at the time was 72 years of age. Now he wasn't a minister or a preacher or a pastor or an evangelist. 
He did teach a Sunday school class and was a deacon in the church, but this man, 72 years of age, just a, a lame member, he'd had a great ministry of healing through the years. I remember one man said to me, he was 40 some odd years of age. And he said to me, now I'm, I'm Presbyterian. I don't, I don't belong to the full gospel church. His wife did, but he said, I'm Presbyterian. Now he said, you know, a number of years ago, when I was just a little boy, I had double pneumonia. And my folks had the doctor. The doctor came to the home. You see, these, this was years ago when doctors made house calls and so on. And he gave me all the medication of the day and so on. And the boy grew steadily worse. And finally, this doctor, who happened also to belong to the Presbyterian Church, said, you know, he said, uh, this, uh, I've done all I can do for this boy, and he's just simply not responding. In fact, he said, uh, unless something happens, uh, he'll not live past midnight tonight. And then this medical doctor, who, as I said, also belonged to the Presbyterian Church, and these people, this family, this home, were Presbyterians. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do if it were my boy. I'd call for that full gospel deacon, old brother so-and-so, and have him to come and pray for him. He said, this Presbyterian doctor said, you know, my wife had cancer. Well, I sent her away to a large city, to cancer clinic, and uh, they confirmed the fact that she did have cancer. But by the time she'd gotten there, it was too far gone. Of course, I know they know more in these days than they did then about it, but anyway, they would not operate. They sent her home to die. So he said, I, I knew what was going on as a medical doctor. So he said, I, I had uh, this full gospel deacon and his wife to come and lay hands on my wife and pray. And he said, God healed her. My wife's still alive. She's healed of cancer. So he said, I tell all my patients, they get beyond my age. I'll tell you what I'll do if it's me. I'd send for this full gospel deacon having to come and pray. So this Presbyterian family followed his direction. They called for the full gospel deacon. He prayed. The boy was healed. But here's the point I want to get over to you. So many people as a last resort. This was a last resort. Sometimes they'll turn, you know, to God, to the word of God. But this man who is now 40 some odd years of age, he said, you know, my, my family thought, well, now, we always go to the doctor first, and then we call for this full gospel deacon later, but why not just give God first chance at it? So he said, you know, from then on, if anything ever happened to me, they'd call for him to come and pray, and I'd always get my healing. And so he said, you know, I just simply have been raised up without sickness. Well, they began to put God's word first, and it paid off for them. I remember a Baptist minister down in the state of Texas, who didn't even particularly believe in divine healing. But this man, according to his own testimony, as I said, I, I know the fellow, he said that he had had problems with his throat, bad tonsils, and so on. The doctor, who was also a member of his church, the Baptist church, kept telling him that he's going to have to have his tonsils taken out. So he set a date to have them taken out. Well, every morning the family would read the Bible and pray. They had children that was of school age, and they'd read the Bible and pray with them before they went to school. One morning when they were reading their scriptural lesson, it was the that very day, in fact, later on, he was supposed to go to have this uh, operation. But anyway, it was apt to be in the chapter they were reading, and so they read about King Asa, where it said he was diseased in his feet, and instead of seeking the Lord, he sought unto physicians, and he died. Now this Baptist minister said that this struck him, and he realized that he hadn't even prayed about his tonsils, not even prayed about it. So he told his children, his wife, then, that they should pray about his tonsils and pray about this bad throat. When he prayed, he said the Lord told him not to have him removed. And to his astonishment, the Lord healed his tonsils, healed his throat, and it never had had any trouble since then. Now there's a lesson to be learned here. The verse doesn't say that the king died because he put the physicians first, but it implies that he ought to put the Lord first. We should train ourselves to ask ourselves what God says about these things. Or in other words, we should train ourselves to ask ourselves what God has to say about anything that may come up in our life and put that word first then. Sometimes families and friends will try to rush you into things, but you need to think about what the word of God says. 
we need to put God's word first in every area of life. Now then, let's come to the fourth point. You know, we gave you four, four rules to uh, train, to educate, to develop the human spirit. Number one, med by meditation in the word. Number two, by practicing the word. Number three, by giving the word first place. Now then, let's come to number four. By instantly obeying the voice of our spirit. Now, the human spirit has a voice. We call that voice conscience. Sometimes we call it intuition. We call it an inner voice or guidance. Now, the world calls it a hunt. I don't like to use that term, but actually it's in, in, in use in the world. The world calls it a hunch. But really, it's your spirit talking to you. Every man's spirit has a voice, whether he be saved or unsaved. But the new birth is the rebirth of the human spirit. And so a man that's born again has become a new man in Christ Jesus. Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the 17th verse says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now you see, the man he's talking about here is not the body or the outward man. Remember in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Paul says, for though the outward man perish, or our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So you see, there's an outward man and there's an inward man. Now, Peter made a statement in 1 Peter, the third chapter, the fourth verse, he said, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Now notice the expression, man of the heart. And then notice the expression, hidden man. Pull them together, hidden man of the heart. Peter's expression here, hidden man of the heart. Paul's expression there in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, inward man, gives us God's definition of the human spirit. Now, this human spirit is an, a spiritual man or a spirit man, an inward man, a hidden man. That is, he's hidden to the physical senses. You can't see him with your physical eyes or feel him with the physical hands. And this is the man that's become a new man, a new creature in Christ at the new birth. And old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. As you give your spirit the privilege of meditating upon the word, then this is where your spirit gets its information. You need to learn to obey your spirit. When a man is born again, his spirit is become a new spirit. God prophesied or gave a word of prophecy. Both Ezekiel and Jeremiah prophesied that the time would come when God said, I'll take out of you the old stony heart, put a new heart in you, a new spirit in you, and then I'll put my spirit in you. And so under this new covenant, the new birth becomes available. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Everything that was old, the old nature in this spirit, in his heart, is taken away. All things have become new. This newborn spirit, as you give your spirit the privilege of meditating upon the word, your spirit will become strong. And that inward voice, which is your conscience speaking to you, your spirit educated in the spirit will become a true guide. For the spirit, Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Your spirit has the life and the nature of God in it. The Holy Spirit dwells within your spirit. 1 John 4, 4 said, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in your head. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in your spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. The devil doesn't dwell within you. He's on the outside. He can't be giving you the information because he's not in you. He's on the outside of you. God has to communicate with you through your spirit because that's where he is. He isn't in your head. Your spirit gets its information through him. Learn to obey your spirit. Some people say that the conscience isn't a safe guide. But that statement isn't always true. It needs to be qualified because the conscience is a safe guide in the believer. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit or the voice of your spirit can become the voice of God, God speaking to you. The spirit of man, this text says in Proverbs 20, 27, is the candle of the Lord. God will use your spirit to guide you. He will use your spirit to enlighten you. As your spirit has the privilege of meditating and feeding upon the word of God, that it becomes more and more a safe 
guide. It is trained in the word. Paul said that he always obeyed his conscience. The Holy Spirit, with some of us who have certain ministries, does not speak to us a little differently, but mostly in the lives of believers. The inward voice is the voice of your spirit. Sometimes people say, well, you're a ministry, so the Holy Spirit would speak to you differently than he would me. No, he deals with us in ministry and enables us to minister differently, but in speaking to us individually, as an individual, he deals with us just like he does in the life of believers. He speaks to us with this inward voice, our inward witness, our inward tuition, which is the voice of our own spirit speaking, not just the voice of the Holy Spirit. I hear what the Holy Spirit says often, but I never hear him for my own benefit. Usually when he speaks, it's to direct me to help someone else. For my own guidance, I have to follow my inward voice, the inward voice. The Holy Spirit very often speaks to me about others. I have to follow that inward voice for my own personal guidance which is the voice of my spirit speaking to me just like you do. A prophet's ministry isn't given for the benefit of the prophet. The ministry of a prophet is given for the benefit of others. I know God deals with me and led me into the prophet's ministry. A lot of time people think, well, the prophet knows. He knows everything, but he doesn't. He only knows what the Spirit of God enables him to know. I have to know through my own inward voice about myself. We miss it, but not always looking to the spiritual. Many times we put a fleece out, tell God you do this, and if you want me to do that, why you do something else. What you want God to do is to come over into the sense realm. Gideon put a fleece out. Gideon didn't have the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit only came upon on certain ones back there then to minister. And he was what we'd call a lay member. And he didn't have the Holy Ghost. God had to deal with Gideon through the senses because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. God might do that today. But if he has to do it, it's because we're so spiritually dull. Under the New Testament, Jesus said another comforter would come. Gideon didn't know the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit. God deals with man through his spirit and by the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And Jesus said that he would guide us in all truth. Now, Satan is the God of the sense realm, not God. And so many times what people are trying to do is to get God to move in this physical realm or this sense realm. But you know, nowhere in the New Testament does it say, as many as are led by fleeces, they are the sons of God. No. But you'll find that the Bible does say in Romans. The 8th chapter, the 14th verse, but as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. God is going to lead you and to guide you through your own spirit. You need to know that. The Spirit, Proverbs 20, 27, the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Too many times people are just simply missing it because they're not taking advantage of what belongs to them. I know one businessman told me that he'd lost several thousands of dollars because he got involved in a business deal and a fleece that he put out made it look as though he should do it. He had all of his business in good shape, everything paid for, owned a beautiful palatial home, it paid for. But someone came along with a business deal. He had everything paid for, he didn't have all these thousands of dollars on hand, he didn't have money on hand to operate his businesses for your own more than one business. And so he mortgaged his property, his businesses, and borrowed thousands of dollars. He said, I said to the man, well, let me pray about it. The man said, well, we'll have to do something by just in a couple of days or else this opportunity will be gone. He said, I put out a fleece. He said, now, Lord, if you want me to do this, you do something here in this natural realm. So like, you know, the old boy that was engaged to be, or, or going to the girl, he wanted to become engaged and be married. He said to her, now, Lord, said, I'm going to put a fleece out here now. I want your will. And if it's your will that I marry Mary, when I ask her, however, to say yes. Well, now, you see, that fleece wouldn't turn out just right necessarily because she might want it. This old boy, and she might have said yes, whether God wanted her to say yes or no. And so this businessman's fleece said, yes, go ahead, mortgage your business go into business, he followed the fleece, lost all the money, and, several, and a couple of years later was still trying to pay it back, you see. And he said to me, after you'd heard me teach, he said, all the time, I remember now, an inward voice was telling me not to do it. Now, instead of following the inward voice, he followed the fleece and lost all the thousands of dollars. And so for these years, he had wondered where he had missed God. But you see, he'd been confused, he said, until he got straight. He remembered the inward voice telling him not to do it. Well, so many times it's that way. God is going to guide us through our spirits. And that if our spirit that has a life in the nature of God in it has the privilege to meditate in the word of God, our spirit becomes a safe guide. 
I know in my own individual ministry, I heard years ago uh, people talk about, even other pastors sometimes, talking about putting out a fleece. I put out a fleece one time and passed of a church. My fleece said I ought to go. So I left this church and took another one. And I'll tell you, I got fleece. I learned it didn't work. God has a better way than a hit and miss system. That was the only time that I ever missed God in changing churches or leaving a church. The rest of the time I prayed, I listened to the inward voice and obeyed my own spirit. And when I did, then I operated in the perfect will of God. And it's just so much better to be in the perfect will of God. And so friends, I would advise you to do this. Learn to obey the voice of your spirit. If you're not used to doing that, of course, you won't get that quickly. As you walk in the light of the word and put into practice these four rules that I give you, eventually you'll come to the place where you will know in your spirit what you should do. You will be able to get guidance even in the minor details of life. You'll always get instantly a yes or a no that you will not get there overnight. We are talking about how to train the human spirit. We have said to you, may we sum up now in conclusion, that your spirit can be educated as the mind can be. Your spirit can be built up in strength just as the body can be built up. Your spirit can be trained, educated, built up like the mind and the body can. But your mind was not educated, trained, or developed overnight. In other words, you didn't start, start the school one week in the first grade, and the next week they graduated you from the 11th or 12th grade. Or if you started a, a program to build up your body with certain physical exercises, you didn't take one exercise and arrived at the desired end. But by going to school, as you continued to go to school, and your mind became educated and trained and developed, then eventually you did graduate. And the same way with your body as you continued with these physical exercises or system of exercises that you may have set up, your body became firm, the muscles became toned, and you were built up in strength. So then, follow these rules that I give you in training, educating, and developing your human spirit. And in the process of time, not overnight, but in the process of time, I want to reiterate it, in the process of time, you won't get that quickly, but eventually you'll come to the place where you'll know in your spirit what you shall do. You'll always be able to get instantly, even in the minor details of life, a yes or a no. Remember, Proverbs twenty twenty seven, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly.